Welcome to LaGrange First Church of God. This is our weekly podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, uh, my name is Jason Shacko. Uh, go to church here with you. Uh, actually, kind of surprised to be back up here again so quick. Um, so it went like a year and a half or so between times I spoke before. Um, and uh, when I got done speaking at the start of June, Ben told me, hey, good job. Do you think you'd be up for trying it again sometime? Emphasis on sometime. And I said, well, yeah, sure. You know, just give me a call when you need it. I'll be around. Called me 20 minutes later. He's like, hey, I'm having surgery. I need you to preach next week. <laughs> cool. Uh, and I was like, all right, great. What do you want me to talk about? He said, you can talk about anything you want. Anything. I said, anything? And he said, make sure it's in the Bible. I said, okay, good. I appreciate that. But the Bible's pretty big. I was like, you know, he goes, whatever's on your heart, whatever God's putting in your life, go for it. I, I did not realize how much pressure that was going to be of like, I can speak on anything. And uh, something that had been on my mind quite a bit was that actual that parable of the lost sheep. And um, so I started trying to work on what, what God wants me to say about it. And then I listened to Pastor Lewis last week. And it basically like hit and emphasized a lot of things I was thinking about this passage. Now, this passage that uh, we just read, a lot of times gets a pretty surface level rap of like, it's about going out and getting more people and bringing them in. And that's kind of contrary to what Lewis was talking about, about making converts versus disciples. If you were here last week, or if you didn't, you can catch it uh, online, go back and watch it. Pretty good stuff. Um, There's some references I'm going to make even to that sermon this week, but I think when we go um, a little deeper into it, we're going to see um, some things that's a lot more than just getting seats, getting people to fill seats uh, in, this, in this parable. Um, so um, I made sure, those of you guys that heard me last time, I made sure I had all pages of, of the sermon this time. It's all here. Uh, didn't move at all. Um, I was joking around first service because Ben told me if I speak again, I can't, I can't write it all out. He said, you need to stop doing that, writing it all out. Just have some notes or just use the projector. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'll just use the projector. And then first service, it wasn't working. And I was like, see, God's on my side. I'm allowed to have these because that's not even working. I'm not going to preach the whole time just looking at my notes like this. So, ha! Then they fixed it. So I don't know, I don't know where God's at on that debate about me using notes or not, but I got them and I got all of them. Um, so this picture up here is actually uh, an artist's rendition of the parable of the lost sheep. It's by Alfred Sword, S-O-O-R-D, if you want to Google it later and make it to your back screen or whatever. Um, and what you see here is the essence of that parable, right? It's a young shepherd leaning off a cliff on a high ridge. He's got his, you know, he's grabbed onto a rock with one hand and he's going to try to swoop this lost sheep up with his other. He's risking his own safety going after it uh, to get this sheep who has wandered on precariously to the side of a cliff. But what makes this picture of it compelling to me is, while that is an amazing image and, and it shows us how God uh, thinks about us, us being the sheep, right? Um, there's also a bird of prey in the back. Right? And that's the part that stuck out to me the most in that picture is that bird is circling, waiting for failure. Right? If that shepherd doesn't complete his job or falls while doing it, there is a real danger out there circling, waiting to feast on our failure. And that's a reality. And then I wanted to point that out because I think it shows us the complexity of this very simple lesson. You see, Jesus usually taught with really simple stories because the people he knew, as Nate astutely pointed out, as sheep, are pretty simple people. So he needed to keep the lesson pretty simple so we could follow it, right? But that parable, it's really boils down to what the kingdom of God is like. It's a good shepherd who has a flock of a hundred sheep who, if he loses just one of them, is willing to leave the others and go find the one that's lost until he finds it and brings it back to the fold. It's a simple point, but when we look closer, 
There's a number of other unexpected things in it, just like that bird in the picture. And that's why I'd like us to, to think about this morning. Specifically, about this parable, what does it say about the nature of God? What does it say about us and our relationship with it? And what does it say about our relationship with each other? So what we can find in this parable, if we look at the three things that I just mentioned, we look at the three perspectives of this story, it's going to give us a lot of insight onto what Jesus is teaching about. While we do that today, I'd like you to reflect on the role of God, the role God is speaking into you. I'd like you to reflect on what role God has for you. Is it the shepherd, a defender, a watchful eye, a person running after lost sheep? Is it actually the role of the lost sheep? Are there temptations and distractions pulling you away from the flock? Or is is your role members of the flock, the encouragers, the comforters, the connection point? So let's look at those three things. First, The parable strikes at the heart of our value system and confronts what we know about the enormity and the magnitude of God's infinite mercy, forgiveness, and love. I mean, it's just what we just sang about, right? Let's listen to this once more. He says in the the verse, Which of you men, if you had 100 sheep and lost one of them, wouldn't leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that was lost until it was found? He's asking them, which of you wouldn't do that, right? And the answer to that question is, is, is... it's like nobody, nobody thinks that way. Nobody would have a hundred of something, lose one, and go leave all the other 99 and go try to find that one thing. Because we're programmed for a certain sense of acceptable loss, right? We, if we had a hundred sheep and we lost a sheep, we would think, oh well, that's the cost of doing business with sheep. You know, like one of them's gonna wander off, I've still got 99, right? Hey, it's only a 1% loss. No big deal. While I was preparing this sermon, I got really hung up on why Jesus used 100 as an example. 100, leaving 99, lost one. And and what really stuck out to me was, well, the math was easy, right? (laughs) You lost 1%. Um, But I think when he really says it that way of saying, hey, you had 100 sheep and you lost one of them, it really lets us... uh, dismiss that one that's lost in our natural mindset because that's acceptable. You know, if, if a baseball player was up to bat 100 times and he got to hit 99 times, we'll put him right in the Hall of Fame, right? We're okay with him striking out one time. You know, we, we get that mindset. Like, if, if, if the story was about a shepherd who had two sheep and lost one, left the one there and went and ran and found the other one, we'd be like, yeah, of course, you've only got two sheep. You better find that other sheep. But if he has 100, why do we care about him losing one? That's the way our mind works. But that's the point. As far as we're concerned, losing one's okay. As far as God's concerned, it's not okay. Every single sheep counts to God. And that's the first lesson we can take away from this parable. With God, nothing is lost. Now, if you're trying to take on that role of doing shepherd work, you may not always want to go looking for that lost sheep. Right? That might not be something you have time for. Right? This is what Pastor Lewis was really talking about last week. We make excuses because we're too busy. Right? If any of you have ever tried to plan something with me, you know that that's my, my go-to. I always have a reason to be too busy. I had a buddy I've known since sixth grade, uh, and he wanted to get together. He just wanted to go out for dinner. Right? Uh, or He's getting married next year and wants me to officiate. And he's like, hey, I'd like you to meet my fiance before you marry us. I said, okay, great. This was, he called me on May 2nd. We just went out last night. Right? It is June 29th when we went out. right? And he's like, well, when can you get together? I just sent him a picture of my phone calendar and said, pick a, pick a date that doesn't have a circle on it already. And that's yesterday was the day. right? I make those excuses that I'm too busy. right? That's why I'm not good in a shepherd role right now. Because I am stuck in a default, I'm too busy mentality a lot of times. And a shepherd, like the one we see there, can't do that. You know, you look at that, Jesus doesn't say in the parable, the shepherd counted all the sheep and found that one specific sheep was missing, right? Like Nate was like, he didn't see Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy's missing, we got to go find him, right? He just counted the sheep, found one was gone, right? And ran out to go find it. 
What that shows us is that it underlines us that every single sheep is important. It doesn't matter which sheep it is. If you're part of the 100, you need to be found. So if you're trying to do the work of the shepherd, you need to know what flock you're supposed to be watching. Right? God has people he wants you to help with. But it needs to be, you need to be sure it's a manageable number, right? And I say that because we're very caught up in a society of, of, of gathering people, right? Like, I've got a lot of friends. Oh, I've got 89 followers on my social media. That's a, I don't know. <laughs> it's not a lot. I'm feeling old when I say things like that, right? But, like, we get into this numbers game, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, that we don't want to be in. That's not what shepherding's about. It's not about numbers games. Um, the actions of a shepherd in this story show us how we have to act if we're going to take this role on. Answering the call all the time. And if you're going to do that, you better really care about them. Right? You think the shepherd in that picture is just ho-hum about that sheep. There's no way he's putting his life on the line to go after him like that if he doesn't care about him. So that's like rule number one. If you're going to try to be a shepherd, you better care about the sheep. A lot of times, we give up way too easily on people. When other people fall through the cracks, we say, oh, well, you know, can't win them all. Maybe they'll come back. That's not so in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like no other shepherd we can see. He's not a hired hand. He loves the flock. And when he has 100, he's going to leave them. He's going to leave that 99 to go find that one because it's that important to him. And I want to emphasize that as we wrap that point up, that with God, nothing is too lost to give up on. I think that's important. So we're going to shift from that role of shepherd into the second one, and that's, that's the role in this story of the actual lost sheep. And I was curious, now, okay, I'm from Fort Wayne. Um, there weren't a lot of my friends in my neighborhood that had livestock. Um, I didn't know about sheep or really any kind of animal uh, outside of you know, dogs, cats. Um, so I didn't know much about sheep. The first real sheep I've ever seen was when I came up here for 4-H one time and I was visiting Elisa over the summer and they, they thought it was a lot of fun to take me to see country things. Um, it, was, it was always a good time. They'd walk me into one of the barns like, watch how he reacts to this. Like, Here's a live animal. Um, not that I was scared of them, I just didn't know how to handle them, right? So I, was one, I wondered when I was researching this, like, why do sheep even wander off? You know, like, we, I had heard a lot of those stories. I, I taught about animals when I taught animal farm in my English class and, like, kind of their intelligence levels and things like that. But I, uh, I didn't really know why they wander off. Why are they so hard to herd, I wondered. Why do you need dogs and big staffs and things like that to keep them in line? Uh, and as I was trying to equate this, like, I, I knew why people wander off. Like, it's, it's easier for me to understand human behavior, right? People get mad, right? People get upset about something that was said to them or something maybe they said that they're embarrassed about, shouldn't have handled that way, so they leave, right? They wander away from whatever flock they were in. Or possibly, like Pastor Lewis was talking about, they just get so used to the routine and the habit that they mentally wander off, Right? that they just kind of go about their business and then sooner or later they're not with, with the flock anymore. Pastor Lewis pointed out very astutely last week that you can be in here right now and still be wandering off. You can be thinking about something else right now. You can be processing, hey, I wonder if I should order Subway and go pick it up on the way home. I wonder if I'll have time to mow. I wonder if I can get out to the lake before. You can be thinking about other things about yourself and wander off and still be in here. You could be counting down the minutes till I stop talking. <laughs> glad we don't have a clock like that before the church service started, <laughs> like one and a half. I'm glad we don't have that for sermons. Um, what I found when I started looking at sheep was the most common reason sheep wander off is because they're eating. <laughs> okay, right? They, 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 they put their head down, they find a tuft of grass, they eat it, and then they keep going and finding more and more food to eat until they look up, finally, and see that they're 
far removed from the flock. They don't know where they are. They don't know how to get back. I said, man. <laughs> Crystal, thanks for nodding. It helps. Uh, <laughs> very ag-related family. Like, yes, it happens. I'm like, yes. City boy got it there. Um, but no, they, they, they wander off. <laughs> but to take that analogy back, right, they're meeting their own need at the time and not looking at anything else, and they get far away removed, right? You see that in your own life? It's not that sheep are particularly stubborn or rebellious. Like, nobody's got a sheep tattoo, right? Like, I'm a rebel. Um, or, like Nate pointed out, it's not that they're necessarily stupid and they don't know how to stay with it. They just, it's in their nature to stray. And when they do, they get lost. And this concept of, like, nibbling your way through life on stuff that interests you until you get too far removed, it, was, it, it hit home for me. You know how many times outside of Sunday do I put my head down and just do what interests me, right? Just do that, do that, do that, and then I look up and it's Friday and I haven't thought about my Bible or I haven't thought about my relationships with other Christians and I realize, man, I'm pretty far off track. I get back to church. Pretty soon we're stuck on the side of a cliff on our own. All still with me. Okay, I don't even know if that's still on anymore. That's okay, I'm good. All right, so we're stuck on the side of a cliff on our own, and when we're on our own is when we make our worst decisions ever, right? Jesus tells us that right in John 15, 5. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So we know being separated from is a bad thing. But when we get lost, it's extremely hard to find our way back on our own. You see, the devil preys on that. He fills us with lies that say we don't belong back with that flock anymore. You've wandered too far. You're off track. You're where you shouldn't be. You don't deserve that flock anymore. And we buy into it. Those feelings of inadequacy are hard to overcome on our own. It's hard to look at yourself if you've separated and say, no, no, I do. I have value. But guess what? God sees you that way. He sees you on the side of a cliff and says, you are a value. You are worth me risking everything to come get you. God still wants you, even if you're in that role of the lost sheep. The good news is that we have a good shepherd who comes looking for those who wander off. And he searches until he finds us, and when he does, he brings us back to the fold. You see, the parable ends this way. It says, when he, the shepherd has found the lost sheep. He carries it on his shoulders. Rejo you don't even have to walk back. He's going to carry you on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors to them, and he says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. How many times do we rewrite the end of that parable in our minds? To be honest, it sounds something like this, right? We found, the shepherd found the sheep brought it in, he carries it on his shoulders, but he comes, he calls his neighbors and friends together and he say to them, well, it's about time. Or, I hope you learned your lesson, right? You can come back this time, but it better not happen again, right? We sit there and we pass judgment when those sheep come back in that way. Great, I'm glad you're here. Hope you learned something. Eat and then look, eat and then look, right? Don't, don't get caught up in like... That's not the way the parable ends. We are not called to do that. We're not called to say, you screwed up. Better not happen again. He calls all of his friends and neighbors together, and they rejoice. And that brings us to the flock. Now, this is not a glamorous role. In fact, Alfred left it out of the picture, right? He left the 99 out of his picture completely, didn't he? Because it's not flashy, but it is an extremely important perspective in this story. You see, with God, we live in community with each other. So that to talk about being lost is actually to talk about being separated from each other. In other words, the sheep was lost because it was part of the flock to begin with. And the very fact that it belonged to the flock made it obvious that it was missing. See, when the shepherd counted heads, 
which I think would be hard, not falling asleep, you know, counting all your sheep every morning, right? He's counted his heads. He said, there's only 99. I'm missing one. I got to go, right? Because he was a part of it to begin with. It wasn't like he counted them up and said, I've got 99. I better go get another one, right? Math is too hard. I don't want to be doing percentages with only 99. No, he had 100. He knew one was missing. Pastor Lewis touched on this last week when he talked about not paying attention as people moved towards the window, right? There's a significant role you play as a member of the flock. There were 99 other sheep in this parable that didn't do a thing when the lost sheep wandered off. That's a key point I want to get to today. Now, there's probably multiple reasons why the flock didn't notice when that one sheep came up missing. But I bet one of the major reasons was they were doing their own thing. Right? They were feeding their own needs. They might have had their own head down, grazing, while the other one drifted off. So as a, if you find yourself in that role, as most of us do, your job is also to watch those around you. We live in a day and age of very superficial friendships and not real relationships. And you know something in this church that we try to work on very hard is real relationships. And that's what I want to emphasize. I think people get so stuck up, stuck up, stuck on, maybe stuck up, on the number of people in their flock. Right? Oh, I got a big, I got a big group that I'm friends with. I got all these people that, that I care about, that care about me. That we worry about like collecting, and we don't worry about creating connections and being connected to the greater body. That's a major role of of the, of the flock. You see, being lost has more to do with the connection to each other. We're all interrelated. So when you talk about one that's lost, at the same time, you have to talk about the effect that lost sheep has on the flock. I, I love this. I want to get it right. I'm going to read it directly here. Um, there's a correlation I've really come to appreciate because it's not about numbers, it's about relationships. I've come to appreciate this, that the more intimately connected to someone you are, the more you agonize when you're separated, right? The closer you are to a person, the harder it is to function when they're not around. The less connected you are, the less it matters, right? You can go about your day. I think about this a lot with my wife, Elisa. When she has to be out of the house for training or something, there's not a person I'm closer to in this world. There's not a human on this earth that I'm closer to than my wife. She's not even here, so I told her already this morning. Uh, right? But there's not. And when she has to leave for training and she's gone for multiple days, we are a wreck at the house in more of the ways than one. But like, like the house doesn't function well without her because she knows where everybody's supposed to be and she knows where all the stuff is. Um, and... I did, you know, she's gone for like four days. I'll just text her, hey, which kids do I have? How many can go to your mom's? And where are they supposed to be? Uh, help me. She's out doing her thing. Still going to help me. But, but aside from just the functionality of how she helps our house run, there's a big part of us missing when she's not there. Right? And the same thing's true with our larger flock. When someone's missing, it has an effect on all of us. There's special, unique gifts that you have that if you took them out of the flock would make us less. When I thought about this, I was trying to illustrate the effect of a person missing from the flock and then how we should react to go get them. I, uh, I thought of a story from 10 years ago now. Um, Elisa and I took our kids to the Toledo Zoo. Okay, so Lily was five. Uh, the twins were three, and then Allie was nine months old in a front pack. I got to walk around the zoo with the baby right here. Um, so uh, I thought about illustrating how far she'd come by putting her in one of those and bringing her up here today. She, she opted out. Um, so, okay, flashback, Toledo Zoo 10 years ago, um, and 
we were outnumbered. It was a bad idea. <laughs> it was just E and I and then four kids. Kara, uh, one of our three-year-olds at the time, loved climbing things. I'm pretty sure at the time she was climbing a monkey cage or something. Uh, Chuck was in a, a stream that they had at the river. He was trying to play, and, uh, and so we got separated. Okay, It wasn't a good tactical plan. Elisa went one way to get Kara. I took Allie and went to get Chuck. And in the meantime, Lily, who's a huge nerd, um, wanted to go. There was a day camp at the zoo also, and she wanted to go learn about plant life, like how plants grow. <laughs> God love her. He does. Uh, so she, in her defense, she swears she asked both of us, right, can I go to this class? It was starting. Like the teacher was going to get started telling about how roots grow. And, and I'm trying to get Chuck out of the water. Elise is trying to pull Kara off the, off the cage. And Lily comes up missing. She went in to learn about plants or butterflies. I don't know. <laughs> I think it was plants. Uh, she's in there listening to that. I get Chuck out of the water. We get Kara back together. Five of the six of us come back together, and we go, where's Lily? Boom. Instant panic, right? We're in Toledo now without one of our kids, and I look around, and there's a lot of people who are semi-invested in finding my child, right? They went to the zoo. They kept track of their kids. They didn't want to really slow down to help me because they didn't really care about Lily, right? I, I don't mean to make them sound horrible, but they, they didn't know her. They didn't know how awesome she is, right? <laughs> they didn't care as much as I cared, right? For Elisa and I, it was the end of the world. Everything else stops till you find your five-year-old who's been misplaced, right? She was fine. <laughs> but everybody else kind of was like, ah, I hope you find her. What did she look like? A little girl? Okay, cool. If I see her over here, I'll let you know, right? Like, they weren't as invested in that as we were. Now I happened to go past a window, and I saw her sitting in the front row. She, she joined a day camp to learn about plants. Like, I, uh, I don't get her sometimes. So I go in, and I grab her. probably looked like kidnapping. Like, I just went and just grabbed this kid off a tour. And the thing about that story that gets me is I wasn't upset at her at all. I wasn't angry. I was happy. And when they talk about, I try to think about how this shepherd would be after he gets off the side of the cliff carrying this sheep home. That's what it was. We hugged her so hard, I'm pretty sure she might have passed out, right? Lack of oxygen. All five of us, the twins didn't know what was going on. Allie was just squished. But like, we were just rejoicing and happy. We had found her. We were complete again. Right? And that's the essence of the kingdom of God and this flock in our story. You see, we're family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're joined by a common allegiance to him. And because we belong to the body of Christ, even when one goes missing, something about us is missing as well. The kingdom of God isn't complete until everybody's safe and secure and accounted for. That's why it's so important for us not to give up on those who dropped out of church or fallen by the wayside or gone astray or are sleeping right now. Kidding. We live in a community with each other. It's not simply these people are lost, but a part of us is lost as well. Either we live in a community with each other or we don't live in one at all. And that's exactly how God sees his children working together as a flock. So we cannot take the attitude of, oh, well, we lost one. Maybe they'll come back. I want you to think about this for a second. And maybe God's putting something on your heart. Is there somebody that you would be surprised with if they came to sit by you today? Because that's the other role of the flock. It's to rejoice. We're called to rejoice when they come. Right? When I was writing that, I thought, yeah, there's a couple people. I hope they're not necessarily watching. I thought of a couple people that I was like, I don't know if I'd rejoice if I had to sit by them. We're not friends right now. But you know what? They're brothers and sisters in Christ. And I should be happy. That's something I got to work on. See, the image of a shepherd and his sheep is so profoundly comforting to many of us, especially those of us who memorize 
you know, Psalm 23, that God is a shepherd leading us uh, with his imagery to say, lie down by green pastures and, and, and feel your soul restored. But leaving the 99 to go get one by any practical standards is too big of a risk. What if we only have limited resources? Right? What if there's a wolf nearby? What if that one person's so stuck in their ways they're never going to listen to us? What if they're too far away? We're called to risk it still. To ignore the odds. Compassion, caring work is not a numbers game. It's a one-by-one one saving through inclusion. I Hear me again. I am not talking about recruiting people to sit in seats. What I'm talking about is caring about people so much when they wander on their own, you're willing to drop it all and go after them. In Jesus' parable, the 99 sheep weren't tethered or penned up. Never noticed that until I started writing this sermon. It didn't say he counted them all, realized one was missing, went back, closed the gate, made sure they were all tied together, and then went and looked. No, he just said 99, not 100, I'm out. Right? To go look for it. A good shepherd knew they could look out for each other while he went and searched for the lost. They had safety and comfort together. You see, this sheep story is a comforting story because we know if we wander, we'll be searched after. But there's also a challenge in this particular message. You might be in the role of the flock, and if that's the case, you got a job to do. You should be watching out for each other. You should be providing safety for each other, a sense of connection. With this shepherding imagery, it's tethered to that challenge of this passage. For if we're truly going to follow Jesus' model, when you're doing the work of the shepherd, you have to risk it all to save the lost one. That means 100% of your effort going after that. That means the other 99 have to band together to take care of what needs to be done for the flock. Keeping others connected is your role. Be ready to rejoice when that lost sheep returns. And that gets us to that discipleship challenge Pastor Lewis was talking about last week. Don't become so consumed with your own needs that you forget to look up and figure out what else is going on with the others in the flock. We are called by God's voice in this passage to value each and every other individual. To risk it all to save the one. I wonder this. Are you doing that? You may not be called right now to go out and find one. You may not be called to be the shepherd right now. But you are called to be doing something. You're one of these three things. Right? You're in one of those roles right now. When lost sheep come back, you may be in charge of rejoicing. You may be in charge of making sure they know they feel included. Because I think you all have known, I think we all have, that guilt of feeling like I strayed too far and I don't belong here anymore. That friendly face could be the thing that makes you stay with the flock. Once you've been found, if you are that lost sheep, right? once you've been found and gathered back into the fold, accept the rejoicing. Right? Accept it. It's hard to do. But use your specific gifts to strengthen the kingdom of God and do the work that he has set out for you. You bring something unique to the flock, grab that. Because I think we all have the innate spiritual capacity to answer the call of shepherding. I do. The parable teaches us we don't have to settle for getting almost everybody. Right? We can save them all. We don't have to settle for 99%. We can get 100. Each one of us looking out for each other is what it takes, though. To save 
the hundred percent it takes each and every one of us doing our role and it's one by one by one by including and being included by the relationships we build I learned something about sheep I love talking to music I should love you guys I'll be a singer someday uh, <laughs> I learned something about sheep that I love right like I was researching sheep. I was trying to learn about sheep. I, I know more about sheep than I should. And not having a sheep. I don't want a sheep. Don't bring me a sheep. Um, <laughs> get home. <laughs> flock waiting. Um, I learned this about them because everything you read about sheep is they're dumb. Right? Like, and I feel bad, but I learned this. Jesus, in Jesus' time, what they did in a village, if they all had them, they all had sheep, they would pin them together overnight. And then when they came in the morning, each shepherd would go up to the gate of the enclosure and he'd call to his sheep to lead them out to the pasture. The sheep could distinguish the voice of their shepherd and they would follow that one. That's what Nathan was talking about in, in the opening chair point, right? My sheep know my voice. That's a real thing. Sheep know the voice of their shepherd. How accurate is that to the world we live in today? How many voices are competing for you to follow it? But there's so many that are asking for our loyalty. The point is we have that innate ability to discern the voice of God, calling us, offering us the comfort of the flock and the green pastures, telling us to bring everyone to eat. Let's listen for God's voice in the passage and in our lives as time for comfort and challenge to include the care for everyone. No matter the cost, the sheep who is imprinted with the voice of God, listening for God in prayer, is awakened to the ability to shift between the three roles I talked about today. Because they're not static. They're not static roles. You're not like, oh, you're a shepherd all the time. Or, oh, you're part of the flock. Or, oh, you are the lost sheep all the time. We just keep losing you. Right? You're not always in those roles. You're always in one of them. Right? You can shift between those in the same situations in your life on your journey. You aren't a shepherd or a member or a member of the flock or a wandering sheep. As you pray, ask God, what work do you have for me? Are there people I should be willing to risk it all for right now that I'm not noticing? Or are, are you in the role of rejoicing and surrounding lost sheep when they return? Or should you be paying attention to others around you? Or are there temptations and distractions in your life that you need to eliminate to avoid wandering off? Thank you for tuning in. Please join us for next week's podcast.